Hello. Hello, this is Odin Hadas from Tracepan, and today's video will be about the security in the 10 pawn technologies. I'm referring to XGS pawn, XG pawn 1, and NG pawn 2. I will be using XGS pawn throughout this presentation, but I'm also referring to the other two technologies. What we'll be talking about are the security risks and how these technologies address them. So let's start with the first security risk. Uh, this is actually the same security risk which was also mentioned in the GPON technology. And for those of you who haven't watched our video transmission basics video, uh, it's explained in detail there. The idea is that whatever the OLT sends in the downstream, all the ONUs or all the customers can see. And the risk is that a malicious user can connect to the ONU and actually sniff the traffic of all the customers. Uh, the second risk, which is new to the 10 Vault technologies, is actually the opposite. The malicious user would connect to an ONU and send packets in the upstream. And by doing this, it could forge, it could impersonate a different ONU. In other words, perform a theft of service. The third risk is the same or a different malicious user would connect on the pawn, somewhere on the pawn, uh, and be able to both sniff the traffic on the pawn and inject or generate traffic back into the pawn. And then the fourth one is similar to the previous three, but here uh, they also added the element of recording the packets. So the user is recording the packets or the, the traffic from the pawn, and then after some time, injects it back into the pawn. So having seen these four risks, how does uh, the standard propose to address them? So the first mechanism to address these risks is AES encryption. This is something which, as uh, we explained in our GPON video, also exists in GPON, uh, but there are some differences. First of all, GPON only supports AES in the downstream direction, because as we said, the main security risk that it's intended to address is a customer sniffing to the downstream packets. In XGS pawn, AES encryption can also be done in the upstream. It is optional, as in GPON. Uh, practically, uh, in the downstream, it's more commonly used than in the upstream, but it can be supported in both. Uh, another addition in XGS pawn is that it supports two encryption keys simultaneously. So for every packet, the end, the side or the end that sends it can decide, now I'm using key number one or key number two. And that's true for the OLT that's encrypting the downstream packets, and for an ONU that's encrypting the upstream packets. So this is the first mechanism, again, as in GPON, but enhanced in several directions. Uh, the second mechanism, which has several options in the 10 GPON technologies, is, is authentication. There are actually three kinds of authentication that are defined registration based, OMCI based secure mutual authentication, and IEEE 802.1x based secure mutual authentication. The first two, or the first one, is different from the other ones because these two are mutual authentication. And let's explain the differences. If we talk about the registration based authentication, this is a registration, this is a, sorry, an authentication based mechanism that can authenticate the ONU to the OLT, but not vice versa. It's based on the registration ID, which is assigned to a subscriber at the management level. In other words, it may be hard-coded into an ONU and then has to be provisioned into the OLT, or some ONUs also allow the user to change it via some local terminal. Uh, it is very similar in nature to the password in GPON which is also optional. Uh, the way it works is 
The ONU sends its registration ID. You can see an example here in HEX and ASCII. Uh, the OLT tests or checks in its database whether this registration ID is defined. If it's defined, okay, this ONU is good to go. If it's not defined, then this ONU is rejected and doesn't get service. Now, uh, the other set of authentication options are the mutual the secure mutual authentication options. They authenticate both the OLT to the ONU and the ONU to the OLT. In other words, each end tests that the other end is acceptable. This requires a pre-shared secret key, which is called PSK. We know both to the OLT and the ONU. And the way it works, here we see an example uh, of OMCI-based mutual authentication. Uh, there is and obviously I manage entity called and has security control. And as we see here, there are various messages that are exchanged between the OLT and the ONU related to the enhanced security control. And these determine or these allow each end to authenticate the other end. Now, when we talk about secure virtual authentication, since there is a pre-shared key involved, it is typically used when the OLT and the ONU come from the same vendor because the vendor can make sure that they know the pre-shared key. When involving different vendors, uh, there must be some mechanism to transfer this pre-shared key from one vendor to another. Uh, this is not uh, commonly done. And this is why it's typically used only when they are from the same vendor. Uh, the main uh, downside of this is that it can cause interoperability issues. In other words, prevent third-party ONUs from connecting with the OLT. To prevent this, there are some service providers that refrain from using this mechanism. They tell the vendors, please disable it uh, because I want to be able to freely choose any ONU and any OLT and not have this restrict me from interoperability. There's also another mechanism that some vendors propose, which is something called an interoperability license. And the way it works is the following. When the OLT and the ONU come from the same vendor, they would use the secure mutual authentication. But if it's a different vendor, uh, then the ONU would say, I don't support and has security control. You can see in this example, it says unknown managed entity. And then if the OLT has this interop license, it will just ignore it and fall back to the registration-based authentication. So bottom line, this adds more security, but it has the downside of causing interoperability issues, and that's why some service providers refrain from using it. Uh, so we spoke about two mechanisms, the AES encryption and the registration. Uh, the third mechanism is called MIC, or in other words, uh, message integrity check. This is an 8 byte field that is used to verify the sender's identity and prevent the forged clone or OMCI message attack. As you can see, at the end of every clone message, uh, we're showing the registra registration again as an example, but it's true for any message. There are eight bytes, which are the MIC, of the sending end. The same is true for OMCI. And here's how it works. Using the PLOM or OMCI message content and the shared integrity key, the sender computes the MIC and transmits it with the message. And using the same content and shared key, the receiver computes the MIC and compares it with the MIC value carried in the received message. Now, if the two MIC values are equal, then the message is valid. Otherwise, it is declared invalid and discarded. So these are the basic principles of security. If you want to learn more, you're welcome to go to the webinars on the TraceBrand website. There are various webinars about this technology, and they, are, they have extended information. Uh, if you want to learn more about the company, go to our website, www.tracepad.com, and you may contact us at info at tracepad.com. If you like this video, give us a like, and you're welcome to subscribe to our channel.
Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.